dog. Um, he was sick for about a month and the vet wanted to do a fungal test and a heartworm test and all of these other things. And I said, well, he's an indoor dog. It's like heartworm's not gonna be an issue. Still ran the test. And then they said, well, it could be a fungal infection in his lungs. And I'm like, but that really isn't relevant to Wisconsin. Like everything that would cause a fungal infection isn't in Wisconsin. But yet they ran the test and I had to pay for that. And it ended up being um, pretty aggressive cancer that we ended up just putting him down for this week. Um, but then again, it was over $800 worth of tests and visits trying to figure out what was wrong when they could have looked at his x-rays and told me that it was cancer. Yes, errors in admission. And, and I've, um, I've heard a lot of uh, instructors here at Rasmussen University talk about their belief about errors in admission and they're, they're common in healthcare, animals, humans, dentistry, errors in admission are very, com are very common. Um, I had one doctor who was, again, very ethical. Whenever um, I would go to see this doctor, the first thing he did is he had a laptop computer out in front of him looking at what my insurance would cover. So he would not recommend some expensive procedure or test if he knew that I would have to pay a lot of money out of pocket, you know. And it definitely seems like some of those, you know, those tests that they recommended for your dog, you know, you, you didn't really need those and they were very expensive. And that's why a lot of companies are offering pet insurance now, you know, to protect people. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story, Jenny. And I'm sorry, what happened, you know, to your dog. Um, our um, topic this week in the Ethics Around the Globe course is Confucian Ethics and African Ethical Theory. So welcome everyone to the Module 4 live session. This meeting is being recorded for the benefit of your classmates and you, in case you'd like to watch this video later. We're going to continue with our um, review of the Eastern ethical theories. Last week, we talked about Buddhism, where the focus was achieving nirvana. Um, and we are going to move now to Confucianism. Confucius lived in 500 BC, the same site, the same um, year as Socrates. Socrates, of course, was living in Athens, Greece. Here, um, out in China, Confucius was living in the ancient state of Lu, which is just below Beijing. So this is where Confucius spent most of his life, right here along the Yellow Sea in China. So Confucianism originated in China and then its influence spread to Korea and Japan, what they call these this area, the dragons. Let's talk about some of the, the central ideas in Confucian thought. This is the first week we're really gonna talk more about metaphysics. Um, metaphysics is really the order of the universe. Ancient philosophers really, really didn't understand the, the way that we do now um, um, what, is it, what is in the universe. They didn't really know about the heavenly bodies and planets and the moon and the earth. Um, that All of that was um, determined later. A lot of metaphysics was not understood. Um, for Confucius, he came up with the idea of cosmology. And for him, everything was the Tao, the way, the one, the absolute, the underlying power, the source. This ever-changing um, expression of the Tao and the power is demonstrated by the yin and the yang, which is a symbol that's very familiar in Chinese Mars, just showing the different characteristics that are out there in the world and how they balance each other out. Aspects of things are female, some aspects are male, aspects of darkness versus bright, aspects of cool versus hot, moist versus dry, passive, active, negative, positive, evil, good. And, you know, all of these different aspects, characteristics, and traits can be found out in the world, right? Um, Usually they don't coexist in the, within the same entity at the same moment, <laughs> but these are, this is the yin and the yang that, um, that the world is an ever changing expression of these different characteristics. 
So the Chinese conception of the yin and the yang and other classical philosophical dualisms, that where most dualisms are in conflict, such as the individual versus society. That's a classic Western sort of dualism, that there's a conflict between the values of the individual and the individual's um, will and autonomy versus society and its needs. Um, the yin and the yang in Confucian ethics are actually in harmony. And both are considered to be necessary to maintain the order of the universe. Let's go back to the classic Western um, philosophical dualism, the individual versus the collective. Can you give an example of that conflict, Jenny, in modern society where the values of autonomy may conflict with the needs of the collective in the, of, 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 in the greater good? Well, that I mean, could that be almost like political, where you need they have a purpose, but at the same time, that purpose is not always the best for everyone. Okay, that's good. What would you? What would be a specific example that is affecting everyone right now in healthcare? Well, <clears throat> like initially, it was like um, the Obamacare and health plan. It was good because everyone had insurance and could qualify for insurance, but then the negative, you know, um, a lot of people's insurance went up because you had to have insurance. They could charge whatever they wanted to for it. So in one aspect, it was good. The other aspect, not so good. Okay. That would be the, again, the collective, the individual versus society. How about the pandemic? Can you think any of any is aspects of the pandemic where the values of an individual and their autonomy might be in conflict with the needs of society and the collective as a whole? Well, vaccine and vaccine mandates. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I have some friends who believe in autonomy uh, and, you know, that they decide what happens to their body you know certainly in nature you know natural law sure in nature we have complete autonomy over ourselves but once we join into a society with other human beings and agree to the rule of law and to be part of a collective society now we give up some of those individual freedoms and some of our autonomy for the greater good of society and that's where the mass mandates the social distancing and, and the vaccines come into play so yes so so that is what um that's what's being discussed here that the chinese conception of yin and yang is that you know these two act in harmony where the western idea that philosophical dualisms like the individual versus the collective are often seen at odds and and you know and I think especially in a society like ours where there's so much diversity and so much multiculturalism and uh I've never seen you know anything as uh diverse as the is the way that America is today with so many and some people even call it culture wars there's a book out called culture wars you know where you've just got so many different belief systems and we're all trying to coexist in harmony in one society where people are believing all sorts of different things and again it's that it's well you know what if i as an individual don't believe all the things that maybe the collective society does or or certain groups within society believe a lot of things that i don't believe in you know and then there's so there's a um a sort of a conflict and um so could this even go so, beyond covid and the you know the whole pandemic where you had um the uprising with anti-vaxxers in general where they would not vaccinate their children and then you know diseases and things that have essentially been eradicated had started popping up because so many people weren't you know of fear of autism and and whatever reasons they weren't vaccinating now all of these diseases started popping up again absolutely and i've done a lot of research into that topic and there was a um, what it was there was a scientific study that came out gosh it was probably 15 years ago that sh demonstrated some sort of link to vaccines and autism so a lot of people jumped on that and says i'm not going to get vaccinated well a few years later someone else came out and completely discredited that story in that study 
that whole publication where it was authored that there was a link between autism and vaccine, that has now been shown to be totally scientifically false. But some people are still holding on to that, that fake study that came out and uh, they're using that as the basis for not being vaccinated. But the study that they're relying on has now been completely discredited in the scientific world. So yeah, that's another, that's an aspect of the individual versus the collective. Absolutely. So yeah, you have a good understanding of some of these, um, some of these dualisms that exist. Any other comments about that? And I, again, as our society becomes more and more diverse, and I, and I mean diverse, not just in terms of the looks, but in terms of the belief systems of the people who live here, because I'm always hearing stuff that I'm like, you know, because <laughs> my beliefs really haven't changed that much since I was five years old. But a lot of other people's, you know, are coming up with all these new ideas. And, you know, I keep saying, well, that's a great idea. But have you got any scientific, any any type of evidence or theory or anything to support that, you know? And people think, again, it goes back to cultural relativism and subjective relativism. People think that whatever they think is okay under that idea of relativism. And people like me who believe more, and I, I tend to go more for objective moral theories that are can be applied across the board.
I am so sorry. <laughs> Is everyone still here? We are, we were all just talking. <laughs> Technology is such a pain. Thank you for waiting. I absolutely apologize. We figured you were trying to reconnect and, and join us again. Yeah, thanks for your patience. Okay. Fortunately, I already have a recording of this live session, so I will just share that with the class and we will keep going. <laughs> what a pain. All right, so anyway, um, let's see if I can get this uh, slideshow going again. And I absolutely um, appreciate your patience. I was totally going off on some tangent. Oh yeah, I was. My point was about um, that Confucius Confucian ethics is still, I think, demonstrated in the Chinese culture today in the way that that culture likes to maintain order. Do you all agree or disagree with that? Any thoughts about? whether or not you believe that that the Chinese culture still has evidence of a belief in some Confucian beliefs in harmony, order. Do you think that's legit? I don't know much about the Chinese culture, but from the things I've seen, I would assume so. Um, they seem really heavily into a tradition, so I don't see that that portion breaking off anytime soon. Yes, I would agree. There's a lot of respect for elders. There's a lot of respect for family. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that um, that they have maintained a certain sense of order in their culture. And also a belief in harmony. There's not a lot of crime in China compared to the US. Children are very obedient to their parents. All righty, great. So um, your module four assignment is going to ask you to get creative. And basically what it's going to ask you to do is to discuss the Confucian ethical theories. And the Confucian ethical theories or Yi, Rin, Li, and Sao. Let's talk about what they are. Yi refers to the righteous, just, and appropriate conduct. So in your module four media assignment, you want to show the reader, the person who is looking at your presentation, that you understand the Confucian ethical values. So let's talk about what they are. Yi, According to Confucius, there's an objective, absolute, and unconditional moral obligation on all of us to work for the universal well-being, the common good, and the general welfare. And it's an objective, absolute, and unconditional moral obligation. It's independent of cultural differences, feelings, or anything. It extends throughout the whole sphere of moral obligation. And that's that everyone should be engaging in the in the in righteousness, just and appropriate conduct. Rin is a positive formulation of empathy, compassion, and love for all of humanity. This the negative formulation would be the silver rule. The golden rule is due unto others. So Rin is a love for all humanity. That would be, you know, when you see a starving a person, you stop, you give them money, you give them food. It's when churches, you know, have food drives and people in, who work in soup kitchens are serving the homeless and the hungry. That is, that's yin. That is, I saw it um, last year, I was um, driving downtown through downtown Las Vegas and there were some homeless people living um, on the street. One woman was literally laying on a street corner and a young man just came by and picked her up, grabbed her and moved her to a, a more sheltered area where at least she wouldn't be laying on the street. I myself would not touch a homeless person. I don't get involved in that. But this young man, hey, he's young, he's idealistic, and he literally approaches homeless women 
he picked her up. He put her in a in a safer area where she would not literally be laying on the street with traffic. And I said, hey, there's a human being that still has some compassion and some care for humanity. So that would be Wren. Um, if you see a firefighter rushing into a burning building to save a child, that's a love for humanity. Um, and that's a Confucian ethical value. It's a, it's an empathy, you know. Sometimes people really feel a deep empathy, empathy for people who are poor or who are suffering, and they don't just turn away from that. You know, they try to help the situation. Lee is an appropriate and proper conduct. That's a Confucian ethical value, and it, within that is also the doctrine of the mean, just like the middle way. Um, there are five relationships that Confucius focuses on when he talks about the proper conduct between husband and wife. There's an appropriate and moral conduct between parent and child. There's an appropriate and moral conduct. Elder sibling, younger sibling. I always looked up to my older brothers. Elder friend, younger friend. I always looked up to, to elder friends and asked them for advice. Um, ruler subject. The, the ruler is someone who's supposed to be smart, moral, ethical, in charge, and um, have a, a proper conduct. And and the subject means that we, to some extent, will obey those people. So when you talk about proper conduct for Confucian, it's within the context of these relationships. Lee, the filial piety is Zhao. There's two spellings of it. Zhao and Zhao are both filial piety, which is a devotion to reverence and parents and family. Because for Confucius, the institution of the family is a foundation of a well-ordered and civilized society grounded mainly on respect of children for parents in respect for age, experience, and wisdom. And Jenny, Barbara, Desi, this is what I feel is still being demonstrated in the Chinese culture, more so than other cultures. I still see a lot of filial piety. Again, if you go into a Chinese restaurant, they're usually family owned, right? The children are working for their parents, their parents' business, keeping that business alive. And um, they respect their elders. They listen and, and they get advice from elders within the within the um, within the family. And the children are supposed to respect the parents. Now, what do we see happening in America in terms of the family, Jenny? In my opinion, a lot of it is polar opposite. In the with with the Chinese um, belief system, when someone gets older, they take them into their home and they take care of them until they pass. In Western civilization, we tend to shove them in nursing homes and kind of forget about them until they're gone. Um, yes. The lack of respect from Western civilization, um, it just, it wouldn't fly with with their beliefs and, and their traditions. It just, it wouldn't. I agree with you. Uh, and there, there was a time again, where family was very important in American society in the 1950s and sixties, it was the nuclear family husband, wife, you know, 2.5 kids. And that's kind of the era that I grew up in. My parents met in church in 1960. They had a very platonic courtship where my dad would send my mom letters and flowers and candy while he was in the army. And she wrote back to him and they got married in 1962. And they, after they were married, they started having kids. Everything was done in order. And it was done because they believed in family first that was the most important thing to my parents was getting married starting a family and uh there was a lot of respect and you know i never talked back to my dad i would have been killed you know it was just i wouldn't even want to talk back you know i don't talk back. i didn't talk back to my parents if i talk back to my mom now i'd get my head knocked off you know it, it, there's just respect and i respect my uncles and you know and because they have lots of things to say and 
Um, that's just the that's the value system that I was raised under. Now that's really changed drastically over the years. Now people are mostly raised in single parent homes. Most Americans are single; they are not married. The idea of the the nuclear family is way in decline. In fact, I remember the early days of Dr. Phil. I don't watch it anymore, but the, a lot of it was family dysfunctionality. You know, he was trying to help dysfunctional families where the kids were talking back to the parents. The kids were hitting the parents. What? I mean, do you think that would fly in China? And 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 even today in traditional households where, you know, there's still filial piety, there's no such thing as a child hitting a parent, okay? That does that's the opposite of filial piety. So that's this is important for Confucius because Confucius believed that the having a strong family is the basis of having a strong society, that the family unit is is, you know, is the smallest unit in society. And if that's well ordered and civilized, then you could have a, a civilized society, right? Because children are taught within the family ethics how to behave, right? And again, if you don't have a strong institution of family, then you end up with the kind of society that we're in right now, where we don't have a moral compass. Instead, we have a lot of behavior that is immoral and, and we're having a hard time controlling you know, behavior in this society. So, you know, that's why for Confucius, you know, order, harmony was so important. And along with that came that filial piety. Another aspect of the Confucian ethical system is win, which is a value in music and the arts, the importance of culture and the creation and maintenance of a well-ordered society. I personally have always enjoyed the arts. Um, and I remember when I was younger, I took ballet lessons. I started playing, you know, music when I was very young. Um, music's always been very important to me. I had an art teacher that taught us the value of classical art. We had to learn, when I was in eighth grade, we had to learn 200 classical paintings, date, artist, country, title, 200. It was a lot, but I still have a strong appreciation for Monet, French art, Dutch art, Renaissance art, different movements in the art and how they reflect the culture of that time, because I was taught that at a very young age and I was impressionable. So Confucius also believed that there is an aesthetic value, you know, in the arts. How do you think that music reflects society today, Barbara? What do you think that the kind of music that's popular right now says about society in America, for example? Um, I, to tell you the truth, I can't tell you what's the happiness music right now because I don't really listen to a lot of it because, um, I think back in the late nineties, I kind of stopped. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 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 I was up raised in the seventies, so I'm still stuck there and I love it. <laughs> Look, I, I love it. some of the music today. I, mm, mm, mm. And if my mom, my mom used to tell us, well, if, if you can't um sing that song in front of me or at church, you can't sing that song. <laughs> so, so I kind of still got a little bit of that in me. <laughs> I tend to agree with that too, because of that generation. Yeah, I grew, I was born in the 70s. And back then everything was uh, the baby boomers culture and the Vietnam culture. Uh, was really coming, um, it was still very predominant in the 70s, it was everything that had to do with Vietnam and the civil rights movement. So it was more, it was much more like the music um, of the birds, turn, 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 music of the Beatles, music of the Who, the British invasion, it was that kind of music. You know, it was the early Motown music, Diana Ross and the Supremes, and it was the music of the 60s that really predominated when I was growing up and, and reflecting the attitudes of that time, which was, you know, more independence, more equality and anti-war sentiment and so forth. And of course, the music of that time reflects what was happening in the culture. It was popular music. So, you know, today's culture, you know, reflects a lot of different, a lot of different ideas. Um, technology is a big part of music and how it's made, how it's marketed. So there's a lot of digitization in music now. 
um, and that a lot of rap of all sorts of different rap, all sorts of different cultures, you know, are being discussed, a lot of um, conflict and turmoil, you know, there's songs about, you know, 9-11, songs about mass shootings, songs about school shootings. So today's popular music still reflects the sign of the times, you know, it's just, it's just a different time period than those of us who were born in the 70s when, you know, when other types of music were reflecting the pop culture of that time. So I do think there, there is that there is an aesthetic value in music and the arts in understanding a particular culture. So Confucius recognized that too, and he called that win. So these are the values think, that you would yes. Excuse me, if I may. Um I think a lot of and I listen to really anything 50s through 80s 90s i really don't care for a lot of today's music either um but i feel like a lot of that music they talked about what was going on but it was not really hidden into the music um it was something where you really had to pay attention to kind of get what they were saying whereas i i feel like music today they just come out and say it there's really no you know it's a major lack of filter if they want to talk about the present politics, they sing about present politics and they're just open and blunt with it. Um, you know, they, I mean, a lot of sexual innuendos and things like that are very prevalent and openly accepted where it really, you know, where you have a song of afternoon delight where they say it, but they don't say it. And then you have songs of today where they're openly saying it and it's widely accepted. And then they wonder why yes. America's morals are going down the drain. Absolutely, it's true. There's a major um, Nietzsche said it uh, best at the turn of the 19th century, um, which was the 1800s were the 19th century, the 1900s were the 20th century. Nietzsche said God is dead, and what he meant by that is that he could see a moral decline coming as the role of religion became less important to society as a whole. And uh, we really didn't get to, to the steepest part of the moral decline, you know, maybe until 100 years later, where, you know, there's certainly more evidence of, of a steep moral decline. But Nietzsche said God is dead. And that was in the early 1900s. Of course, he was a nihilistic thinker, um, but it's still a genius by some people's account. And that's what he meant, basically, is just that, you know, um, that we're going to struggle with a moral compass when religion is no longer the centerpiece you know, of, of the foundation of people's mor morality, which it is not for some people. So then what does, what replaces it, right? If, if religion is not the, the focal point and it's not the center of someone's moral system, then what is, right? And uh, if there's nothing, then we're gonna, le we're gonna end up with a lot of nihilism, a lack of any type of morality, no decency, and you see that in music. And it reminds me again, uh, in the 1980s, uh, Al Gore, who was at that time a Senator from Tennessee and his wife, Tipper Gore, had a strong movement for parental advisory warnings on music. They really wanted to censor this. They saw where music was going, Jenny, and they did not like it one bit. So their way was to try to use censorship to say, look, all of this unnecessary and graphic sex and violence in music is going to be terrible for kids. So how can we stop it? Maybe we can we can try to censor the musicians that, that make this type of music. That flies in the face of the First Amendment, free speech, freedom of expression. Um, so they pretty much lost that war. You could still put some parental advisory notes on a, on a CD, but pe people still buy it and listen to it. So, yeah, and we ended up, you know, with what we've got now, which is a lot of extremely sexually explicit and violent music, graphic video games, and of course, I personally do not believe that that is good for young minds to be watching all day, but we have a right to free speech. So it's a problem. It's a big problem. So thank you all for participating in this discussion. So these are the values that you're going to be wanting to talk about in this um, assignment. Let's talk briefly about Confucius's views on politics. 
in terms of a political society, political philosophy for Confucius, politics involved tea, which is the union of power and virtue. For Confucius, the characteristics of a good ruler, our civil servant would be moral goodness, virtue, propriety, rationality, moderation, and benevolence. And again, you know, along with other changes in our society, we can see again the media having a much more um, aggressive role in trying to uncover the lack of moral goodness on any political candidate. Anyone who's running for office now, the media is trying to dig into their their closet and find skeletons so they can show that this person is does not have the characteristics of a good ruler because they have a prior sexual assault charge or they have a prior incident in which they weren't paying their taxes, or they've had some DUIs and so forth. So the media has a field day with this notion that a political ruler should be someone with moral goodness, because the media is just going to try to dig and re do research to show that an individual does not have any morality. And uh, as a public, we're forced to suffer through this as we try to filter through the news. Um, but for the, this is what Confucius believed that you needed to have uh, to have a good ruler would be the union of power as well as virtue, moral goodness, rationality, moderation, benevolence. Can anyone think of one political leader? It could be someone who's local um, that would represent this ideal union of power and virtue, like a state senator, your governor, your mayor, someone in Congress, anybody that you know, past pre or, or present politicians that would represent the ideal union of power and virtue, Barbara, Jenny, Desi. Well, I know, you know, back with Kennedy, those were the things that people voted for because that's what to them he represented. Right, a good Catholic boy. He was a war hero from uh from World War either he was either in World War One or Two I can't remember which one, um yeah he he definitely represented that. Oh yeah, John Lewis. I was so lucky one day. Um, I decided to go to church one Sunday here in Las Vegas, and uh the church he so the churches here are so interesting they have guest speakers and john lewis was our guest speaker barbara i was just thrilled i'm like i got out of bed early i went to church today and john lewis was my guest speaker so it was so cool you know to get to meet him to get to hear him talk that was probably you know six or seven years ago time time flies but yes a, a, a good american i would say um that is i would say obama at least as far as his personal morality, um, not to say anything about his political views, but he's married to one woman. He raised two daughters. As far as I know, he and his wife were monogamous and faithful. I don't think his wife would ever allow him to do anything that beyond being monogamous and faithful within that relationship. So I think he is is someone who has the right moral virtue. Um, anyone that's from a stable family like that uh, would would fit into somebody who really doesn't have any um, skeletons in their closet. I'm trying to think of another president. Jimmy Carter is another one who, is, as far as moral goodness, not that he always made the right decision, but again, he's been married to the same woman for what, 70 years, and all they pretty much did was, you know, went to church and raised their kids, and he still teaches in Sunday school, and he's won an award for, what, uh, for, um, he's won a Wasn't Nobel Peace. Wasn't Habitat for Humanity? Wasn't, he still does Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. Uh, I know uh, Reagan would be, the same thing, you know, him and his wife and they're, you know, I mean, now they've both passed on, but, you know, something like that too. Um, yeah, I think the Bush senior, you know, him and his wife, Barbara, you know, so much respect. Kind of what they ran on was, was moral goodness. And yes, um, yeah, it's, it's stuff like that. You just don't really find much of anymore. No, I mean, there's so much respect for Barbara Bush and, and within that marriage, you could see so much respect. 
And uh, and also the way that they got along with the Obamas, you know, surprisingly, they all got along extremely well. George Bush Sr. and Jr. and the Obamas, you know, they're all they all got along and there was a lot of respect there and they all spent time together playing golf. And so, yeah, I think that, you know, we've been fortunate that we have had a lot of moral leaders, you know, and then some people like Richard Nixon, who seemed very immoral. Um, so, you know, it, 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 there's certainly people, some people think I've had people say all politicians are bad. And I'm like, no, I don't think all politicians are bad. I think it's an individualized inquiry because you can look at people like George Bush and uh, John McCain. You can look at people like that and say, no, these are honorable people, you know, who have tried to live a life of virtue. They didn't always make the right decisions, but at least in their personal lives, they were pretty much moral people. Um, so not all politicians are bad. You know, it's an individualized inquiry. I like well, you just have to look at how much politics can really corrupt a person. Yeah. You know, to see someone that does have that that moral virtuous standing and to see what the pressures of politics and the world looking at you can do to a person. Oh yeah, someone pointed out Colin Powell. Yeah, he's he's also he recently died, which was sad. But yeah, throughout his life, I pretty much believe he was on the straight and narrow. I don't think he really was doing anything shady. <laughs> he was not committing oh, any crimes, huh? You know, Gin Ruth Bader Ginsburg too. Oh, my gosh. Um, what an amazing she had passed person. away. I never realized all of the things that she had done and accomplished. Um, because when she was the Supreme Court justice, they just never talked of it. it. It was just, it was just, oh, here comes, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all that. But after she passed, you just saw all the things she accomplished in her lifetime and just a, a lot of respect. You're right. I have tremendous respect for her. She was an amazing human being amazing. And yeah, I, I looked up all the old pictures of her and her daughter. Gosh, she was so beautiful when she was younger. She was one of the first women to argue all of these important cases before the Supreme Court. She was one of the first people that argued, you know, if you're married and you're a woman and your employer is giving you health care benefits, why can't your husband have those benefits too? Because if your husband had a nice job, his wife would get the benefits, you know? So she was one of the ones that said, look, if I'm a woman and I have a good job, my husband should be able to get health care insurance, you know, too off my benefits. So that was her arguing that. And she argued a lot of, of um, things for women's rights before the Supreme Court when no one else really had the courage to do so. And then she later sat on that court, you know, where she argued those cases so she was such a strong lady yeah apps there are some amazing americans amazing george washington you know we just had president's day george washington was an amazing human being absolutely amazing in a thousand different ways he was a general uh, of the revolutionary army so he had to fight for his own to create the country that he later became president of you know he didn't just get Put in the position he had to first of all fight for his own freedom and then for everybody's freedom to create the united states he was out there in the revolutionary war holding the bayonets and all the other primitive weapons that they had you know during cold terrible winters and starving and when they didn't have any supplies and you know george washington was out there fighting for all of us for the future of this great nation and after the revolutionary war was won they said would you like to be king he said, no, I don't want to be king. He's like, we don't want a king. He's like, we want a democratic and free society where individuals can participate and have a voice in their own government. He could have just said, yeah, I'll just be king. You know, that would have been selfish and narcissistic. But George Washington said, no, I don't want to be king. You know, he said, I could try to be your humble leader, your president for a few years. You know, so there were, we've just been blessed with a lot of amazing, amazing Americans, far too many to, to even mention. Okay, great. Awesome. All right. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So let me get on with uh, a brief discussion of African ethics and we'll talk more about 
this module four assignment, which is going to be your media assignment in which you will be discussing the Confucian ethical values. African ethics is going to be very short and very brief. Let me get this PowerPoint slide um, up. And I'm going to be sharing these slides with you and posting them later after the live session. There it is. Okay, so module four has a media assignment, which is great because it gives you a chance to get creative. Um, so the purpose of this assignment is to write a poem. It should at least be one page. You can write your own song. You can create your own TV commercial. A lot of students just create a PowerPoint presentation with pictures and definitions of um, Confucian ethical values. You could create a movie poster, a travel brochure, anything that demonstrates your understanding of Ren, which is a love for humanity and the other Confucian ethical concepts like the familial piety, the Yi, the Li, the the need for order, proper conduct. So you, this gives you a chance to be free and creative. You don't necessarily have to follow the APA format. I mean, if you're creating a PowerPoint presentation, you may need to include some references. If you're discussing theories and showing pictures, you may need to include some sites to show where you got that information, but it gives you a great chance to just be creative and, and create something. So any questions about that? Awesome. Okay. So I, let's... I have a question. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> it takes me a second to hit my button. Right. Um, when, if you do a PowerPoint or a movie poster, um, do you want all of the concepts? And if so, how many pages should it be for? Yeah, I had a student. She was awesome. She Her presentation was 25 slides. That is not necessary. I would say four slides could cover it. If you want to do more, you certainly can. But I would say four. You know, not everybody's going to be. I was not that. Over, I was never an overachiever ever in college. Yeah, me ever. <laughs> so, you know, I'm always blown away by these amazing students that do this amazing work. But no, you don't need to have 20 pages. Um, this person just wanted to include a lot of pictures showing people doing things that represented like a love for humanity and, and, and things like that. But I think four slides and the focus should be on Ren. Yeah, four slides could be done to cover the Confucian ethical values. Any other questions about your creative and fun module four assignment? I always love grading these assignments. Great. Let's briefly talk about African ethics. So African ethics is based on their culture. Not a lot was written. It was mostly oral traditions handed um, down, just like the one that said, you know, do not sing while in the bathtub, you know, and of course the purpose of that was to teach children not to drink bath water. So for, for Africans, morality is, is really um, part of the, the impact of personal actions on the community, really focusing on your duties to yourself and to the community. There's a taint of relativism in basing moral standards on what the community prescribes, but yet Africans do not say that their way of life is the moral way. Africans just live their lives as if they believe that the way they live is simply the right way for them. So African moral principles emerge or evolve from human society, and they're very focused on responding to basic human needs, interests, and purposes. So African ethics is used to refer to the moral beliefs and presuppositions of the sub-Saharan African people in the philosophical clarification 
an interpretation of their beliefs. One of the central notions in African ethics is good character. And that was also part of Aristotle's notion of ethics, good character and virtue. So for African ethics, society should impart moral knowledge to its members, making them aware of the moral values and principles of that society. In African ethics, char character is something that's been acquired. A person is responsible for the state of his or her character, and character res results from habit. The more ethically you act, that becomes a habit of doing the right thing, and therefore you build character. And I think of that as somebody who gets into the habit of going to work on time. You get into the habit of getting up in the morning, getting dressed, going to work on time. And that seems to, you know, form a good character. You get into the habit of maybe being someone who doesn't really drink, or smoke, or use drugs. You get up every day, you eat right, you do what's relatively healthy, and that becomes, a, a, you know, aspect of your habit. And again, that forms a good character because somebody who is a drunk is typically someone who's seen as somebody with a, a bad character. So, you know, habit, having good habits could also create good character. Getting into the habit of doing your schoolwork. For me, that took years of discipline, you know, getting used to sitting there at the computer, sitting there at your desk, writing, 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 reading, reading, reading. Um, but that becomes a habit. The more you do it, the more you like it, and it becomes part of your character. You become a good, studious, responsible, accountable person who can get things done. And that's a result of habit. Okay, so good character is a part of African ethics. Humanism is huge in African ethics. Humanism is the doctrine that takes human welfare, interests, and needs as fundamental, constitutes the foundation of African ethics. Humanism, the right conduct is always relative to the human situation and does not come from any absolute standards of honesty, but rather from the social good. Conduct that promotes smooth social relationships is good. Conduct that runs counter to smooth social relationships is bad. So it's always about the human situation in Africa, you know, especially when you look to certain countries and it's not all of Africa, you know, Nigeria is a very oil rich and wealthy country. We know South Africa, North Africa, those are parts of Africa that are very wealthy, the Ivory Coast. But, you know, you think of other areas like Ethiopia, where people are starving and don't have any uh, any um, food. You think of there that ethics is really focused on that human situation you know, trying to bring food in to help that society, doing things that will help that society. Um, you know, Bill Gates has a foundation that helps to bring in, you know, clean water and plumbing and helps build, you know, some of the more impoverished areas of Africa. And that's a recognition, recognition of, of the need to improve the human situation over there. Um, so humanism is important. From, from the tribal basis, humanism was the hap, humanism was the greatest happiness and good of the tribe. That was the end and the aim of each member of the tribe. Now, suppose utilitarianism is the basis of moral codes, but the Bantu tribe in Africa, it formed the basis of morality. And that's the standard of goodness in harmony with and conformity to actions must be molded for the good of the tribe. Whatever makes the tribe survive, whatever makes it so the tribe has food, clothing, shelter, um, that's a respect and acknowledgement of humanism and maybe even some altruism, you know. Brotherhood is another central concept in African ethics. Saying that, you know, we're not just acting for ourselves, but that human actions do affect other people and that humanity has no boundary, that a human being's brother is another human being. The human being is what counts. It's more beautiful than gold. If I need help and I ask gold, gold can't really help me. But, you know, if my if my tires flat or my car needs a jump, I might be able to get assistance from another human being. 
So that notion of brotherhood and humanity features prominently in African ethics. The common good is important in African ethics, which essentially good for human beings, embracing the needs that are basic to the enjoyment and fulfillment of the life of each individual. If the common good is achieved, then so is the individual good. And along with this common good is a recognition that there is no human being who does not desire or deserve peace, security, freedom, dignity, respect, justice, equality, and satisfaction. Do you agree with that, Jenny, this notion? This is also true in Buddhism, which is a belief that every human being is entitled to the same moral consideration around the globe, that we should all work together for peace, security, freedom, dignity, respect, justice, equality, and satisfaction. Is that really what every human being desires? Is that really what global ethics should be about? Is trying to achieve peace, security, freedom, and dignity for every human being? At the end of the day, yes, I, I do believe that. And I think yeah. uh, current events are kind of showing that that's what we need to do now more than ever, all around the globe. You're right. It, um, it's it's be, the globe is becoming increasingly small, increasingly smaller, right? Because of technology, you people can fly from one end of the globe to the next. We can do commerce with people from one end of the globe to the next. We can ship goods from one end of the globe to the next. We can we can have we can help refugees from any part of the globe and have them living in the United States. You know, since the withdrawal of troops. Um, and from Afghanistan, we now have more refugees from Afghanistan living in the United States, and they need help. They need legal assistance. They need food, clothing, shelter, so forth. So certainly in this global world that we're living in now, I think there is a belief that global ethics requires security, freedom, dignity, respect, justice for everybody not just America. Because I certainly, when I grew up, I was always like, well, you know, I'm American and I'm lucky and I'm blessed and I need to worry about people that are in my neighborhood, right? I need to worry about to make sure that Americans have food, clothing, shelter, and but I don't have to worry about people in other parts of the world. That's kind of the, group, the view that I grew up with in, you know, in the 70s and 80s. That changed in the 90s um, due to several global movements. You know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of the Soviet Union, um, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Globalism was exploding in the 90s. And all of a sudden we realized, wow, we're a global community where we need to start focusing on the needs of people everywhere. And borders are falling, right? <laughs> there may as well not even be a border between the United States and Mexico. <laughs> I used to live in San Diego, you know. In San Diego, we have a Calexico. <laughs> There's a Mexifornia, you know. Uh, people, of course, you know, at one point, that there were, before 9-11, at least, you didn't need a passport to travel to Mexico. You didn't need a, a passport to travel to Canada either. I've been there many, many, many times to Canada, many, many, many times to Mexico. You know, the, to me, there's not even, there's definitely not much of a, of a border between the U.S. and Mexico, right? cultures are very overlapping in those border towns. So, you know, there definitely is a, is, an, is, a, is a growing understanding, I think, like Jenny said, that we need to understand that every human being is morally entitled to peace, security, freedom, dignity, respect, justice, equality, and satisfaction, at least ideally, if we could help people achieve that. And then it's not just, I need to don't, not just worry about people that are in my community and their suffering, but the suffering of people, of others. I know personally, the United States, from what we have sent and we are intending to send and what Joe Biden is asking for is a total of $10 billion in assistance to the Ukraine. To me, that seems like a lot of money. 
a whole lot. And we mean, we could have a moral discussion just about the United States supporting other countries. We give $3 billion a year to Israel. We've been giving $3 billion a year to Afghanistan. Now, would that money be better spent building affordable housing right here in the U.S.? Would that money be better spent rebuilding our infrastructure, helping the people here, rebuilding schools, bringing more technology, more teachers into schools, paying teachers more? Would that money be treating better? Treating our vets. Huh? Treating, treating our vets, getting, helping the homeless. I mean, the children alone um, that struggle with eating healthy and having proper access to food and a decent education struggle. Um, so I agree with you with us sending money, but at the same time, um, you know, I look at when I really started without really knowing these ethical standards and codes because I was so young, but really looking at um, the 1940s and World War II. Um, the treatment and the lack of security, the lack of freedoms, the lack of dignity, respect and justice that you know the nazis had over the, the jews um you know like reading this it really kind of stuck with me that um you know and now we're starting to see that with russia invading the ukraine and if america bases itself as this big moral and ethical society how can we idly stand by and watch this happen and i understand that ukraine is not a part of nato Granted, they've been asking for years to become part of NATO, but to watch these people fleeing to Poland and all these other places and to watch, <clears throat> excuse me, men and, and other women dropping their kids off in Poland and coming back to fight for their country. Um, you know, do I think that we need to invade, you know, inter, you know, interject ourselves into every situation? No, but something like this, I feel like it could be justified to help them. Instead of, you know, monetary values provide the air support they're asking for. Yes, yours is a very valid viewpoint, Jenny, and I think it's shared by most Americans. Most Americans, I believe, want us to do more to help the Ukraine, to help the cause of freedom, to recognize their human rights. And it is a very, very terrible situation. Everything that Putin does flies in the face of Kantian ethics. Kant is all about universal moral laws, respect for dignity, you know, the value of human life inherent. Everything Putin does flies in the face of Kantian ethics. It probably falls in the, flies in the face of, uh, of Aristotle's virtue ethics, nothing he does is virtuous. Very, 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 very terrible situation. Again, all I can think about is how blessed we are to live in America. And that is because we had some amazing founding fathers, <laughs> Jefferson, Madison, Washington, Alexander Hamilton and Ben Franklin. If it wasn't for them, we would have nothing over here. You know, nothing. You know, their vision of, of democracy, of a, of a free and stable economy, of a free government, of their, their belief in human rights. And they just happened to be living in the right time because throughout Europe, there was an Enlightenment area, era in the 16th and 17th century, and, and our forefathers really jumped on that. Jefferson spent a ton of time in France learning about the Enlightenment, getting ideas from Enlightenment thinkers, and bringing all of that together to found this nation, which is only 250 years old. If we didn't have that, if we didn't have a belief in the American system, in our Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence, we better never throw that away because look at the way these other countries live because they do not have that strong foundation in democracy and freedom, which everybody here had to, somebody had to fight for. You know, it was earned through blood. Everything we have over here was earned through blood. You know, it's so it's just a very, very interesting and, and, and 
there's a lot of turmoil. You know, my roommate from college who became a very close friend of mine was Russian. She told me how horrible it was over there, even though her family was of a very high status. Her father was like one of the top physicists in Russia. They had to grow their own potatoes to eat, you know, have any money. The average income in Russia is $10,000 a year, you know. Places like Switzerland, it's $90,000. So it, that part of the world is really, really struggling. And the Ukrainian people do not want to be a part of Russia. You know, I don't blame them. I wouldn't want to be a part of Russia either. Oh, it's such a, such a terrible time. And uh, yeah, and it does, like you said, it, it does. The situation justifies America's economic support, you know, and, and trying to help the Ukraine maintain freedom against Russia and Putin, you know, who represents evil and a violation of human rights on every level. Any other thoughts about the situation with um, the Ukrainian people fighting to maintain their freedom and their identity? And their culture also is very different. Their history is different from Russia's. Their culture is different from Russia. You know, they have their own identity as a people. It's just tragic. I feel like, gosh, we we finally conquered the pandemic and we got that to a point where it's at least under control. And then Putin starts up again. I mean, the pandemic was, I could enjoy the pandemic being over for one week before Putin starts a war. I know, right? <laughs> he, he's really the person keeping us from having peace right now. And I'm mad at him. So your module three live session question is what are three central concepts in African ethics? Your written assignment is about Confucian ethics, but the live session question is what are three central co concepts in African ethics? And we talked about them. One is good character. One is humanism. One is brotherhood. Common good is, is another one. Okay. Any questions for me? Thank you so much, Jenny, Desi, and Barbara for attending the module five, four, module four live session. And I will see all of you in cyberspace in this wonderful discussion that we have going on right now about the morality of lying to children. <laughs> have a great I, night. I everyone. struggled with this week's uh, discussion. Oh, yeah. Do you think it's okay? Support. <laughs> Do you think it's okay for parents to lie to children? In some circumstances, like, you know, we lie to them about Santa and the Easter bunny, and those are all more or less positive things. But then, you know, when we discussed the you no know, drinking out of the bathtub or you kill your mother, like, that is like psychologically damaging. <laughs> it's not okay. So it's, it's really, I really struggled back and forth. You know, I think it all depends on the situation. Don't step on a crack or you'll break your mother's back. I remember that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't sound good to me at all. Yeah, I think there has to be a better way to teach children, Jenny, than some of these, than these things. And we definitely heard when we were growing up, don't watch TV too much or you'll hurt your eyes, you know? Yeah. Um, what was the one I was just thinking of? Uh, and now it's slipping. I can't remember it. Um, but it was just, oh, like a Krampus. You know, like it'll take you off and eat you and things like that. It's like that's a horrible thing to tell your child. Like, but Santa Claus is okay. Yes, I think in an ideal world, I would like to have the kind of parents who sit down and explain things to me, like what's really happening rather than using fear as a tool. I think society would benefit from parents taking the time to sit down with their children and letting them know what's really happening in an age appropriate way than using scare tactics, because look at how much anxiety there is in society already, you know. We need to do something to reduce anxiety, which would probably be parents having better relationships with their child and talking about the truth about what's happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I look forward to seeing everybody's comments. And I posted a funny video about the 10 lies that, you know, that most people heard from their parents growing up. Well, I'll have to look at that. Yeah, it's great. So, Barbara? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, the video was good. <laughs> it was good. I like Yeah, it. you recognize some of those lies in that video yeah. that have been told. Yes. And I, I think in my post I was saying about, I used to tell my kids that I had eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> and we know I didn't have eyes in the back of my head, but they were good. So I, I thought I was doing the right thing at the time. But now I wouldn't tell my grandkids that because they probably would get something and start checking and, you know, just seeing. Because, you know, like my kids, you could tell them that and they didn't challenge you i guess that's what i can say but nowadays the kids they challenge you with, when you say something so you got to come correct with them because if you don't they're going to be like well why this why you say it like that i don't see the eyes in the back of your head you know i, I can see that now <laughs> that then. Yeah, again, when I grew up, my dad, uh, my dad was in the army for four or five years, then he went Air Force. My dad retired from the Air Force after 20 years. He was a sergeant. Then he went and worked for the Navy for another 19 years. I grew up on military bases. There was no such thing as challenging a parent. It, it was unheard of. I never challenged anything my dad said. I trembled in his presence. And in hindsight, I'm glad that I was raised that way. <laughs> Because again, it you know, where's the order? If if kids are not afraid of their parents, then they're not going to be afraid of violating the rules. If you don't, you know, you need to start by having respect for your parents, have respect for other people, have respect for the rule of law, have respect for order in society, have respect for teachers and rule. But yeah, it, 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 you know, if kids are going to be like, you try to t tell them a moral story and they're like, that's not true, you know, then mm -mm, you got, yeah, it's got, you got problems. <laughs> I agree. I, I think there's nothing wrong with a, a healthy fear of your parents. It's when it crosses over to unhealthy that, you know, people grow up the way they do. Um, but, you know, I mean, I'm in my late thirties and to this day, I don't talk back to my dad. Um, I would never think about, you know, talking back to my mom and to see kids and the way they interact with their parents nowadays. I'm just like, Ooh, I would have flew in the next week, but <laughs> that is not even okay. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It's, I think a healthy amount of fear teaches you a certain level of respect for elders and for others. I have never been hit once in my life, nor have I ever hit anybody, you know? Um, and I think part of that again is my upbringing. I knew never to act up or I'd be, you know, or I'd be in major trouble. So I never acted up. Therefore I never got spanked. You know, my brain was working, you know, I, I knew if I did X, Y, and Z, I was going to be in big trouble. So I never did those bad things. I never got spanked. I, I'm, I try to be a nonviolent person, you know, the kids who do act up and then they get hit and then they suffer the psychological impact of that. And then you're just going down a dangerous downward spiral, you know, of all kind of more psychological problems because you've been hit. Yeah, it, it, it's very, a certain amount of fear of your parents is a very, very good thing. Nobody in my Same. family you know it's somebody you can mess with they're just they're they're very they're very tough violent and dang. i wouldn't mess with my mom either she's tough Whew. she is tough and they can get stuff done too boy i just don't mess with those people <laughs> i'm scared of them jenny i'm scared I'm, I'm literally terrified of every family member i have they are very very tough they're kind, they're loving, they'll be there for you. They believe in doing what's right, but if you are doing what's wrong, you're in trouble. Well, let me tell you, I never really got <laughs> hit as a child. Um, nothing that I really remember, you know? And uh, let me tell you, I am a very jumpy person. <laughs> I, I never got hit, but let me tell you, somebody raises my hand and I'm jumping. Yeah. 
I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole nother issue, too, is whether children need corporal punishment as a form of discipline. And I do not believe that they do, although I wouldn't rule it out in certain situations. Again, back in the 70s, corporal punishment was administered in school by principals. And you know, if a principal hit somebody now, that'd be a report of child abuse. And that principal would be in jail for assault and battery. <laughs> Well, much less somebody's cell phone out uh, recording the whole thing. Oh, you're right. Paddling somebody, a human being, no way. But that was common in the 70s and part of the 80s. That was commonplace. Principals, you got yeah. sent to the principal's office and paddled. You know, again, I knew not to ever do anything that would require me to get paddled. <laughs> I mean, that's a whole moral issue is is the validity of corporal punishment. Right. That's true. That's true. Yeah, the kids today. Well, thank you so much for your time, Jenny, Barbara, and Desi. I really enjoyed this discussion. Have a great week. You too. Thank you so much. I didn't really talk a lot. I have two little ones here, but thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Desi. I appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Night, everyone. Good night. Good night, Barb. Good night, Desi. Good night. Good, Good night, night, everyone.